Welcome to Perfect Sequels, where we're going to dive deep into Jack 3. In the last video, we looked at the first two Jack and Daxter games and did a bit of comparing. To sum it up, I'd say that Jack and Daxter is about 96% quality stuff, and Jack 2 is more around 85%. It's still an excellent game, as the stuff that's good is stellar, and if Jack 3 is going to be considered a perfect sequel, it's going to have to do something about the 15% of Jack 2 that wasn't so good. Now, I think that the word epic has been devalued by improper usage, but I can think of no better word to describe what Jack 3 does. It begins with a shot of a transport vehicle flying through an expansive desert. A handcuffed Jack is let off of the transport and is read as charges. The people see Jack as a criminal and believe that he is responsible for causing the Metalhead invasion during the last game. To be fair, they're right. If Jack had not gone down to the sewers to get the key to the city, crew wouldn't have been able to let in the Metalheads. Even though he ended up saving the day in the end, Jack's selfish lust for revenge caused him to help evil people and put the entire world at risk. As punishment, the city banishes him to the Wasteland for life. Daxter tagged along, too. A group of Wastelanders finds them and decides to take them back to their city as the title screen comes in. This is one of the better prologues I've seen in video games, as even before we get to choose to start a new game, it hooks us with the revelation of Jack's banishment, which, when contrasted with the previous game's jubilant ending, is quite shocking. Jack saved the world and the city, but his crimes and his dark powers make the people distrust him, and his exile could not have come at a worse time. Jack flashes back to the events leading up to his banishment, showing us what's at stake back in Haven City. Despite the defeat of both the Baron and the Meadowhead leader, the new Crimson Guard Deathbots and the Meadowheads have joined forces to wage war against Haven City. They quickly gain ground and even manage to topple the Baron's palace, swiftly establishing the threat they pose to the city. And when these scenes are juxtaposed with Jack clinging to life in the middle of a desert, it pulls you into the story. The city is in grave danger, and its greatest hero has been left for dead. It makes you eager to play the game, and the desert storm that transitions into the title screen foreshadows the wild events that are about to take place. Upon starting the game, you learn that the man who rescued Jack is named Damus, and he's the king of Spargus, a refuge for Haven City's outcasts. He makes Jack participate in arena battles and sends him on missions in the desert to prove his worth to the city, and Jack seems to have no problem with this. In these scenes, one might notice that there is no mention of what's going on in Haven City, and Jack is not eager to return and save his friends. This should come off as strange, given what we saw at the end of Jack 2, where Jack refused to return to his own time because he saw the city as his home. We see in the intro to this game that he's more focused on the city than he is on his own survival. So what gives? Why is Jack so uncaring now? Well, you might better understand his attitude if you knew that Jack is only 18 years old. Teens think primarily using the amygdala, the part of the brain that handles emotions, because their prefrontal cortex, the rational part, doesn't fully develop until their mid-twenties. Haven City betrayed Jack after he saved them, so he became resentful. If Jack was thinking logically, he would consider what his absence would mean for the city and he would realize that everyone, including his childhood friends, could die. But he's not. He can't foresee the consequences that will arise from him abandoning his duty as a hero because he's being driven by the pleasure associated with his new life, where anger and violence are rewarded in full. He can't get over the grudge he holds for the city, and it makes him resent even his friends, who he knows never betrayed him. Jack's skewed priorities and his attitude both indicate that he has some maturing to do as an adult, and we'll see throughout the game how he changes as a person. But for this beginning part, it's obvious that all Jack cares about is life as a Wastelander, because it's fun. Wastelanders are a rough bunch whose job is to go on expeditions in the Wasteland to find artifacts and protect the city, and that's where we see one of the big improvements that Jack 3 brings, driving in the desert. At first glance, this looks like nothing we've seen in either of the first two games, but really, this is just a new take on a familiar type of gameplay. In Jack and Dexter, there was a level called the Precursor Basin, which could only be explored on the Zoomer. You would chase after lurkers, complete ring challenges, and track down collectibles in a big open level that looped around. Jack 3 takes this idea and expands it to a huge desert and gives you a bunch of cars to traverse it with. You'll always be suited to the task behind the wheel of your car, whether you have to hunt down giant metalheads, collect artifacts in the midst of a storm, or chase after bandits. Fundamentally, this type of gameplay is identical to what we saw in Jack and Daxter, but with a new coat of paint and more guns. I really like the Precursor Basin as a level because the kind of gameplay featured in it was only seen in small parts of the rest of the game, and this kind of level was missing from Jack 2. Jack 3 manages to bring it back and work it into the game's structure. 
Instead of exploring the wasteland for collectibles and moving on to a new level, you go in and out of the desert for a lot of varied mission types and this is able to mix up the gameplay well. You'll do a little bit of fighting in the arena, maybe a minigame or some mount riding in Spargus, and then some high speed action in the desert. There are a few cars you unlock as you progress in the game, and they all differ in their speed, durability, weapons, and jumping ability. All in all, I love the Wasteland as an environment, and appreciate that they were able to revisit this cool idea from the first game. Act 1 of Jack 3 is comprised of a lot of these missions, but there's still plenty of the traditional action platforming that the series is known for. Once Jack gains access to the Hopper, a special car with Mad Ups, he investigates an island far from the city. On that island is a massive Precursor Temple. This area is a larger, more linear version of the Mountain Temple from Jack 2, so you'll find some common elements between them. On your first visit to the temple, a lot of platforming challenges will be thrown your way. This is our first real encounter with platforming in this game, and this level serves to remind us that running and jumping are as important as driving and shooting. None of the platforming mechanics have changed, and that's a good thing. There's no need to fix what isn't broken, and this extends to jetboarding as well. I love me some jetboard, and there's a healthy amount of it in this game. This level features many types of platforming to get you back into the swing of things before the rest of the game kicks it into high gear. Pole swinging, ring challenges, falling platforms, stackster segments, sleeper riding, it's got everything. It also introduces us to some brand new goodies. After you climb the temple, glide over to a volcano, and do some exploring, you come across a dark artifact that turns Jack invisible. From here on, whenever you find one of these, you can use it to turn invisible for a short time. This lets you solve puzzles that require you to slip past the temple's robot sentries. It's neat, but it's underdeveloped and underused, since the idols you use to turn invisible are only found in this area. The puzzles are simple, and I think this could have worked better as a sort of timed challenge, where you turn invisible, then have to navigate some kind of course before you become visible again. Later in the game, you can buy a cheat that lets you use this power anywhere, but I think that should have been part of the power from the start. It could have given it a place in combat by having you spend Dark Eco to turn invisible as a defensive tactic. Regardless, Jack's new ability lets him reach the deepest parts of the temple, where the precursors await. They warned Jack of something that was alluded to in earlier scenes. A terrible danger is making its way towards the planet. In order to protect the world, the precursors bestow him with new light powers. Aside from the changes this brings to the gameplay, which I'll get to, these new powers represent something major for our protagonist. In the last game, Jack was exposed to Dark Eco, and this gave him dark powers that were matched by a dark, cold, and angry new personality. His personality led to his involvement in that game's story because his interest in revenge lined up with the Underground's interest in rebellion, but now that same personality is leading him to abandon those he once helped. The emergence of Jack's light powers suggests that there's another side to his character that he has to grow into and that he has to balance it with his dark side. By giving him these powers, the Precursors are making it clear that he's going to need to be guided by a balance between his sense of duty and responsibility and his desire for revenge in order to save the planet. This scene represents the turning point in Jack's character arc, and we'll be able to observe how his decisions are affected from here on. From a gameplay perspective, this scene introduces us to Light Jack, and Light Jack owns. He can heal himself, slow time, make shields, and fly. The time slowing and flight powers are fun additions because they allow for a new approach to platforming. The flight power looks really cool, and these wings will let you jump quite a distance if you time your flaps correctly. Obviously, slowing time will be very helpful in bypassing fast moving traps, but it can also be used in combat to gain a huge advantage, and if you're in a timed mission, you can use it to slow down the timer. Light Jack's healing power makes combat less frustrating. If you're in a tough spot in battle, you can pause for a moment and get a quick health refill and hopefully avoid redoing a mission. The shield is probably useful, but I can't be bothered to use it. That was the one power that I felt was lacking. You also no longer need to max out your eco meter before you can transform. If you have any dark or light eco, you can use it to your advantage, giving both forms a more active role in the game. Overall, Light Jack is cool. His powers are versatile, and his inclusion in the story is natural, but there are even greater secrets hidden deep inside this temple. Shortly after their first visit, Jack and Daxter make a return and come across a high-tech rail system. They ride the rails, and it transports them to an eco mine just outside of Haven City. At the end of that mine, they are confronted by Count Veeger, the guy who banished Jack. He hates Dark Eco, and by extension Jack, so he summons a giant robot to stop him from reaching the city. What follows is an excellent boss fight. The robot will throw enemies at you and will try to hit you with its laser swords. Eventually, he'll create some rock formations which you can jump on so you can make some bombs fall on top of him. 
Every time you damage him, he summons more guys and comes at you faster, making the fight harder. This boss is reminiscent of the first game. In Jack and Dexter, bosses would rotate through a set of increasingly more difficult obstacles, then give you a chance to damage them. All of Jack 3's bosses are similarly designed, and I prefer it this way. This requires you to use more of the skills you've been cultivating, as opposed to Jack 2's bosses which are focused on shootouts. After blowing up the bot, Jack is able to enter Haven City, and the city is… well, it's mostly there. Large parts of the city have been reduced to rubble, and the parts of the city that aren't in total ruin are either overrun with metalheads and deathbots, or they're about to be. This marks the beginning of Act 2, where now that Jack's back, it's time to go to war. He still acts a bit cold towards the city, but he fights regardless, because he has his own interest in putting a stop to the antagonists. This game has two villains, and we already met one of them. Vigor is aware of the dark entity that's threatening the planet, so he wants to use the power of the Precursors to save the day. That's a fine goal, but in order to succeed in his plan, he takes control of the city and lets it be destroyed because he thinks that hidden somewhere in the city is another rail system that would take him to the Precursors. He wants to do a good thing the wrong way. Jack is peeved by this and the whole banishment thing, so he makes the decision to try to stop Vigor. The other antagonist is Arrow, a guy we met in Jack 2. He was the Baron's right-hand man who arrested Jack, oversaw his torture, flirted with his bay, and tried to murder him on the racetrack. They don't like each other that much. Arrow is a crazy robot man now. He's leading the war against Haven City, and he's working with the aforementioned Dark Entity to destroy the world, or something. His motives aren't explained, but since Jack has beef with him and because the Precursors tasked Jack with protecting the world, he's gotta be stopped too. Both villains have evil plans, and both are personal rivals to Jack, and by combining these two aspects, they create a scenario where Jack is able to simultaneously save the world and satisfy his lust for revenge, thus driving home his character arc. Once Jack returns to the city, the game picks up the pace and begins to throw lots of short, action-packed missions at you. Go out and sabotage the enemy's defenses, use their weapons against them, protect your friends while they blow stuff up, and defend the city wherever it's in danger. Since this is a war, there will be more missions here that put combat in the spotlight, but there's still diversity in the kind of missions you take on, as some involve traversing new areas, jetboarding, and both kinds of driving. Some missions will take you back to Spargus to fulfill your obligations as a wastelander as you protect the city from marauders and metalheads and scour the desert for artifacts. When I got to this point of the game, I was able to sit down for long sessions and play for hours because they'd have me do different types of gameplay one after the other, and it was fun and the variety kept me from burning out. But since combat does get a lot of attention here, I should tell you about the guns, the third major improvement Jack 3 made, the first two being the Wasteland and the new powers. In the second game, you received four guns that were based on the four forms of eco that were seen in Jack and Daxter. Those four make a return, but now each one has two additional forms. They're tons of fun, and they all have a place in your arsenal. It used to be that each of the four guns excelled in one thing, like crowd control, range, speed, or power. With the new upgraded forms, they start to dabble in other areas. The scattergun was the go-to weapon for dealing with groups of enemies, but it wasn't great for damage. Its second and third forms get more powerful and affect larger areas, at the cost of being more expensive to fire. The blaster was good at shooting single enemies from a distance, so they decided to add bouncing shots and drones to make it much faster. The Vulcan Fury got insane range, speed, and accuracy with its upgraded forms, and the Peacemaker eventually became a weapon of mass destruction. Take your pick, you got 12 guns here, and they'll all get the job done one way or another. You can cause a lot of mayhem with these things, which is why every time I beat this game, I go and unlock unlimited ammo as soon as possible so I can experiment with all of my favorite weapons. It also helps that there are places where enemies will attack you non-stop. Head into the desert and watch as bandits drive at you, unaware of the kind of weapons at your disposal. Or go into some of the war-torn areas of Haven City where allied and enemy forces clash without end. There are tons of enemies, and people, to use as target practice. The enemy design itself is nothing new, really. If you played Jack 2, then you've seen all of the kinds of metalheads and deathbots you'll be facing. The entirety of Acts 2 and 3 consists of fighting the war and stopping Vigor and Arrow. My coverage of the story ends here. I covered the big things that Jack 3 improved on, so let's cover some of the more minor elements. Jack 2 had a lot of unsavory missions, and they were the primary reason I thought it was inferior to Jack and Daxter. Any proper, perfect sequel would have to correct those flaws to some extent. Let's start with the races, which were not fun because the vehicles controlled poorly and the races were long and frustrating. Jack 3 fixes races by making them easy and making them relevant to the rest of the game. 
There's one race in the beginning of the game that teaches you how to drive. It's three laps with no weird shortcuts or dangerous jumps, and the track is kinda fun with a lot of different terrains. There's a second race shortly after that gives you a better grasp on riding the leapers, and it's also a ring challenge. I will admit that this race isn't that good. It takes place in Spargus, so the path you follow makes a lot of sharp turns and odd jumps that you won't see coming on your first attempt. Those are the only two races. One is good, the other is adequate, and both are relevant to the gameplay, as driving is a big part of the game and leapers are your fastest form of transportation in Spargus. The Titan suit fell out of place in Jack 2 because to me, the levels often clashed with the suit's abilities. This time around, there's only one suit mission, and it's focused on melee combat, simple block puzzles, and basic platforming. That's what the suit is capable of, so let's quit while we're ahead. We don't need to pilot the Titan suit underwater. My least favorite part of Jack 2 were the turret sections because enemies were relentless and could shoot at you from any angle while you were focusing on shooting a separate target to beat the mission. I found it to be very frustrating. In Jack 3, I actually like the turret missions. These are dynamic and fun. You take control of a car or ship's guns and shoot down threats that chase after you. You don't have to worry about defending yourself while trying to complete an objective because the objective here is to be defensive. The turret sections where you are stationary are also cool. There's one mission early on that's just you shooting at targets so you can learn what it's like to use a turret. Much, much later in the game, you hop in the turret and shoot at enemies that drop out of the sky and attack Spargus. That's awesome. The only mission in the game I'd say that I hate is this maze game where you have to collect pellets while an enemy chases you, and at the same time another enemy appears and lays down more pellets. You always move in one direction, but you can control what lane you move in, so while it's an interesting twist on the maze genre, it's annoying. But this is the only part of the game I actively dislike, which is a big improvement over Jack 2, where there are multiple missions that I will always dread playing. The final noteworthy addition to the game would be the revamped Secrets menu. If you explore the world and complete side missions, you'll earn Precursor Orbs, which can be spent in the Secrets menu to unlock a bunch of stuff, including new cars, concept art, a level selector, new game plus, infinite ammo and deco, and even buffs to your guns. You could spend orbs to increase your ammo capacity, increase some gun stats, make their new forms more efficient, or even give them added effects like the ability to stun robots. In Jack 2's system, you just unlocked stuff as you found orbs, and you didn't have the ability to purchase what you wanted. It also didn't have any buffs to unlock. In Jack 3, if you don't care about goofy stuff or behind the scenes material, you still have a reason to participate in the side missions because these buffs are really useful. Usually these missions involve completing time trials and ring challenges. They might have you repeat a mission at a higher difficulty, or they can be as simple as go find this orb in a short amount of time. This is a significant boost to the open world gameplay because the world is bigger but it still feels full since there are more side missions to complete and obtaining a lot of orbs will elevate your enjoyment of the game both before and after you beat it. Jack 3 has everything I could ever want from a sequel. The Wasteland is a lot of fun and it's a throwback to one of my favorite levels from the first game. I love the new Light Jack powers, how they're useful both in and out of combat, and what those powers mean for our hero. The new guns are powerful and add a lot of variety to combat. The story is larger in scope as it deals with Jack's maturation into adulthood and how his evolving personality plays into the fate of the world. All of the missions that I hated in Jack 2 were reworked and made to be quite enjoyable. The world is bigger as it expanded, from one city with a bunch of side areas to two cities and a huge desert, and it's filled with bandits to kill and collectibles to find that have a real impact on your experience with the game. Simply put, it's an epic game that refines old ideas, combines them with new ones, and works it into a story about heroism and revenge that is serious, but still allows for plenty of comic relief. It's one of my favorite PS2 games, and it's a shining example of what a perfect sequel should be.